Now these are the top 20 things you probably should know if you're an HVAC technician going for the EPA exam and they give you a piece of scratch paper and this is what I always tell my students to make sure they know. They don't have to write it on the scratch paper but as much as they can write while the proctor's setting up the exam kind of helps them out. So let me get into it and show you. First we got the baseball diamond refrigeration system. CCME, the compressor, condenser, meter, and device evaporator. We've got everything above here, liquid. we got everything below here, vapor. And then if I was to divide it again halfway through, everything on the right is high. Everything on the left is low. Okay, so they, if they ask you, you know, with this little diagram, what is the state and uh, condition of the refrigerant leaving the evaporator entering the compressor you could see that it is a low pressure vapor and that vapor is superheated because subcooling happens at the condenser here which is what they could ask you something about a receiver you could also use this to answer the questions about uh, maybe the condenser above the receiver or if the evaporator and, and meter and device is on the first floor and you're drawing refrigerant um, from a condensing unit that's up on a roof. So those things could be reorganized to help help you and help you with that The other thing you probably should know about is the hierarchy of refrigerants the CFC's the HCFC's the HFC's HC's and HFO's okay now with these refrigerants come their oils minerals used primarily for the chlorofluorocarbons and R22, but R22 uh, could also use alkabenzene with the rest of the HCFCs. And these in here, these all use the polyester oils. So polyester oils, I call it. And uh, you know that's that's pretty much um, you know the hierarchy of the refrigerants. A couple other things you probably should know about is that the uh, the ozone is the primary reason we're talking about all this those O3 molecules when the chlorine what they found in the chlorofluorocarbon met the O3 really it broke off one of the O's and forms um, chlorine monoxide which is what the scientists first found in the in the earth and then we moved on to refrigerants that didn't have any chlorine but still caused a heck of a lot of global warming potential compared to carbon dioxide, which is our very high pressure refrigerant um, that has our base of one. So other things you should probably know about before you go into the core are, I'm not gonna define them here, but temperature glide, which is the range of boiling and condensing points. These types of refrigerants, the azeotropes, the near azeotropes, and then the zeotropes. All right, these different blended refrigerants down here have, uh, you know, the greatest temperature glide and a thing called fractionations, which is why they need to be uh, put in as a liquid. Some dates you should know about. So some of the dates that you should know about are in 1987, Montreal Protocol formed, which formed the Clean Air Act of 1990 that required all technicians to stop venting after 1992, and then in 1994 become certified in between there, the equipment had to be certified by a third party, EPA approved. And then in 96, you couldn't vent out HFCs because of the global warming. And then in 2000, uh, they kind of stopped putting uh, the refrigerants with chlorofluorocarbons. Production was, was banned and phased out in 1996 as well. And then in uh, 2010, they stopped making the equipment being sold with the R22 in it as part of that phase out process and then in 2020 we we no longer produce R22 refrigerants so and speaking of refrigerants there's the three classes there's the 2, 2L and the 1 and these could either be rated as an A or B refrigerant which A means it has no toxicity or low toxicity and B is high toxicity and then all these break down into the refrigerants flammability rating so you know that you got a, a B1 refrigerant, you know, like 123, that's uh, not very flammable, not flammable at all, and uh, but some toxicity um, all the way up to the hydrocarbon R600 refrigerant, which is not very toxic, but definitely highly flammable hydrocarbon refrigerant. And then you have um, some of the newer ones coming out, like 1234YF that are 2L. They're kind of have a slight flammability 
um, but are not toxic in any way. So other things that probably should know about, speaking of refrigerants, ASHRAE standard 15 says if we're working with any equipment or room monitors, um, we should probably have uh, some sort of alarm set up with a vent and uh, audible tone. And if you don't have any safety uh, scuba, not scuba, but self-contained breathing apparatus, uh, probably should vacate and ventilate and get out when you hear that alarm. Let's talk about the three R's. Recover, which pretty much means you're gonna put it into a tank. Now that tank has got to have a yellow top and a gray body and it's got to be approved by the DOT because it's on the road with the trucks. Whereas when we recycle, that's going to be where we run it through an oil separator or filter to try and get it back to uh, clean with our recovery equipment, which meets AHRI 740 standards saying it can get down to the required levels of vacuum when it does recycle the refrigerant or cover it out. And usually we run a filter dryer through the recovery machine and uh, before it goes in the tank and back into the system. So that's recycling. Reclaiming though has to be done at the manufacturer. And the reclaim means we are gonna get it back to virgin specifications. That means it's gonna be pure again, which mates AHRI 700 standards. All right, a couple things about the types of recovery equipment, though. Since we're talking about recovery, recycle, reclaim, you got system-dependent process, which is more of a passive way of doing things, using the system's pressure or compressor if it's running um, to get the equipment recovered. So using the system. And then you got the self-contain, which is the most common type because it's active, and we're carrying around a piece of equipment. So that's another unit. Another unit, and uh, that's going to be doing some pulling or pushing, that other unit, depending on how you have the arrangement set up. Some things about leak detectors. All right, so you got your electronic and ultrasonic, which are best for the... Uh, hydrocarbon based refrigerants because they don't uh, they don't have an odor in or anything to detect so ultrasonic would probably be um, a way and then even after you find the leak in the general area um, then bubbles soap bubbles to pinpoint the leak you know all right and then remember we're doing after we get all this recover, recycle, reclaim, some sort of repair that's major on the system would be considered any one of these. And they have heat exchanger in some of the test questions I've heard. But dehydration is where we're gonna get our vacuum down to 500 microns and hold. Because the reason is not really just to suck out air which we call non-condensables on the test. All right, non-condensables, not to suck out air, but we're really also removing the moisture by lowering the boiling point. All right, and anytime we are shipping these tanks, brand new refrigerant, they're supposed to be shipped upright, not the DOT tanks, but the uh, tanks that we have for our brand new refrigerants that we bought at the manufacturer, and those aren't to be ever reused in any way. When they're done with their refrigerant, they're supposed to be rendered useless by recovering any remaining refrigerant, and then also uh, maybe drilling a hole in it and popping the valve off in some way. So this has been my little quick study guide of the top maybe 20 things you should know before taking the EPA section 608 core section of the HVAC certification exam. If you like this and found this helpful, please like, subscribe, and comment if it helps in any way. Take care.